neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that you won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and BB King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. <laughs> well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. Good day to you, Mr. Marcelino. Happy How- New Year. Happy New Year, Matt. Happy New Year. You know? How about that? 2014, as as grim as it got at times. Uh-huh was also a pretty damn good year. Yeah. You know, it, it's, are, I think it would split right down the damn middle, man, 50-50. We are doing this, uh, this will be one year. Yes. The one year anniversary One year of anniversary. Show. So, uh, show. how about that? Happy New Year and happy anniversary. Yeah, man. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's good awesome. stuff. It and is. for the new year, you okay. know, we had a very good relationship with Mr. Dave Nassi. Yes. And he did some very awesome stuff for us. So you can check him out. You can go out to our archives. And uh, he did Lick of the Week. Yes. Well, he got a gig. He's playing with like a country band. He got bi- a touring band, yes, right? Or something? Yeah, he got busy. Yeah, and he's still doing all the Skype lessons. He's doing all that stuff. Yep. Um, and it just ran into time. You yeah. know, and and we look. He was doing it for free. We couldn't ask enough. I mean, that was just awesome for him. You to know, do unfortunately, that. there's only 24 hours in the day, and you can't buy more. Yeah, and you know, he, he used all 23. Yeah, and slept for an hour, but uh, <laughs> right. So you know, we uh, he, kudos. He, he said for all that. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it's awesome that he's got some success going on with the band, and he, you know, he he couldn't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And we were like, hey. Well, Thank you for doing what you did. Absolutely, man. You, know, so, you got you to, baby needs a new pair of shoes. You got to put food on the table. Exactly. You know what I mean? So go make the money. And um, and then we, you know, we've interviewed uh, Jason Sedidas. Yes. And we, if, if, matter of fact, if you listen carefully underneath this episode, you will hear um, his his albums. Nice. Um, he, he gave us permission to, to, to do that for a, bed. a little yeah. bed. Yeah. Right? Well, I, he did a, he did a video. And he sent it to us, mm-hmm. and it was it was just crazy. I mean, it was like this, just these fleeting fingers just everywhere. He's got monster chops. And it's just crazy. Yeah. I mean, just these leaps and bounds. And then I said something to him. I said, hey, would you want to do like, uh, because he had a title, Quick Lick. Mm-hmm. So it, we, we got a new segment. It'll be Jason Sedidas' Quick, Quick Licks. Licks. <laughs> and and, and we're, so we're going to run that now every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're a little bit different than Dave's. Dave did more of the teaching side. He went to full explanation of what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, Jason is just laying it out there, and at the end of it, you'll see a little tab with tab, yeah, with tablature. And he does it fast, and he does it slow. Yes. And you know, hey man, these someday are... I'll be able to play the slow version. <laughs> <laughs> these are cool licks. I mean, these are crazy. They're not. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not, not your running the mill stuff. They're, no, they're, they're they're not like in your box uh, or whatever box you pick, pentatonic or, or no. mixolydian or anything. You these will, these are sedidalix. You will be <laughs> yes, they are, and you will be using the neck. Yes. So we yes. can't thank him enough. Yes, thank you enough. And uh, enough. <laughs> he uh, he just and he pumped out a bunch of them. We actually have an archive already. Already, yeah. So we will just bring those to you as the weeks go on for the for the yes. a, a new yeah. weekly feature. Yeah. So Jason, thank you very much. Man. Thanks for taking the time and the initiative and just, and offering the, that to uh, us and, and yeah. our fans, and all the Amps and Axis fans. If you look at it in the back, there's a little East amplifier. True. Sitting in the background. Yeah, well, he's got he, a couple. He strategically put that there. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind it's, of a cool thing. It's called product placement. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I thank him very much for that. Thank you, Jason. Yes. It didn't go unnoticed. This will not be on our YouTube page. This okay. will run on his, but we'll have the link on the front of our page. 
And then we'll archive it out like we do with the shows cool. on the video page that we have. So they'll be out there, you know, forever. Mm-hmm. And you can um, try to learn them. <laughs> <laughs> try is the operative for me. Yes. I, I know that's the case. Yeah, but, uh, he has a, uh, he's just fluent. Yeah. It's just crazy to watch him play. And, and you know? yeah, the, the string, <laughs> so not only the finger span, but the string span from one end of the lick to the other it's just you know you all gonna, six strings and maybe even seven even though there's not seven on the guitar exactly <laughs> and you're going to be using the fingerboard oh yeah uh, you're going to cover some you got some real estate you'll be covering yes so yes. I, I you it's guys can watch those stretch actually. your fingers friends <laughs> yeah stretch you your can fingers. watch those uh with this episode yes so first one first one first one with this episode so thank you jason and absolutely uh, we look forward to more now the other question and i didn't mention this to you okay um, I wanted to see, and maybe we can get some comments from this. If, uh, if I can contact a very well-known classical guitar player, if people would want to hear that interview, a classical guitar interview, an okay. actual classical guitarist, mm -hmm. a, a working classical guitar player that, that's supposedly, um, very popular in that realm of music. He's not a household name. Interesting. But he is... He, well, you know, know it, not being a household name would not be a first for us. No. You know, because I think we've introduced people to a, a lot of names that they did not know before. You can't cover it all. No, no. <laughs> you can't cover it all. You'd have to not do anything else but that if right. you were going to try to cover it all. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but I figured, uh, you know, we put it out there to the listeners and uh, maybe get some feedback. And if we get, you know, a couple people that say, hey, yeah, I'd like to hear about that. Mm-hmm. And then we'll get the guy on. I mean, we had Adam Rafferty, but he's a different type of... He's a fingerstyle player. You know, the right. the acoustic thing. Um, but not a traditional classical. This is a traditional dude, yeah. classical player. And uh, I've never heard any interviews with those guys. So I was thinking maybe that might be something different. How he it, got his start. How He went, He was a graduate from Peabody, which is oh, okay. you know, local. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you know? world-renowned. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. So... so. Yeah, give us some feedback, people. Yeah. Let's. Uh... And while they're giving us feedback, yeah. First, we have to say thank you for tuning in. Yes. Thank you for clicking through the Amazon banner. Yes. We're awesome seeing job. that, and the and the PayPal banner that we have on our website. Cool. But uh, also the comments. We're getting more comments. Nice. And we thank you for that. More of those. Uh, please, as many sure. as you want. Five stars, always. Please, mm -hmm. five star. Yeah. And uh, and helps. definitely. Throw your comments at us. We had some really cool comments that came in. Yes. Especially about the uh, the the tone thing with the wood on electric guitar, how it affected the tone. Yes. Yes. And, and one guy, boy, he wrapped that thing up perfectly. He he I think he put it in a full in a in a closed loop. Yes, you he know? did. Yes. Yes. That was he took cool. it from a scientific place and he also used just normal logic right. and said, no. Nah, you gotta, you gotta put both together. Absolutely. Yes, it does do this, but yes, the wood does do that too. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was pretty interesting. It, it was, it was a pretty close loop. It was, a, it was a very, a very lengthy concise, email. I would love to read it, but it, it yeah, was. But long. it was a very concise um, roundup of how he thinks the physics of it works. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, it was really good and yeah. and, and succinct and like. Damn, <laughs> that has to be how it works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was very cool. It was very, very cool. And, and I can I can attest to it. Um, and just real quick, I'll give you an, uh, an example. I had a Carvin, and mm -hmm. it was maple neck through, and it had poplar wings. Mm -hmm. So the body had poplar sides, but the maple neck, maple fingerboard, maple neck through had didn't have stainless steel frets. And I ran every type of pickup in that guitar known to man. Mm -hmm. and I could not get that thing to warm up for anything. I went and got a PRS, and it was a standard, so it was all mahogany with a rosewood fingerboard, mm -hmm. and same pickups, a JB and a 59, and I was like... Totally different. It was completely different, and they were the same scale, by the way. They were both 25-inch wow. scale. Wow. So I, that, I imagine same string gauge and, you know. Oh, well, yeah. I don't yeah, change right. any of that. So, right. and they were, there was no tremolo on the PRS. It was a stop. Hard tail. tail yeah. You know, and then the carving was the same way. So, I mean, I was like, well, what can I do here? I mean, there's right. no, you know, and that, that carving would not get warm. 
I mean, yes, you know, body shape makes some difference. Headstock shape makes some difference. Angle makes a little difference. All these things make difference, Mm -hmm. make a difference. But well, they would be pretty close to each other, though. You know, those two guitars, the headstock angles about the same. Now, I had six on the left side. Okay. For tuners. Uh, The PRS, of course, is three three plus three, three, but it's still a straight string pull. Okay. Okay. You know, and and so is the carving. Mm hmm. Um, my Carvin did have 24 frets. It was a cut. It was a standard 22. I, I, the bridge pickup did not sound the same. Wow. It was the same exact pickup. Mm-hmm. Came out of the Carvin, went into there. I was like, well, it's night and day. Wow. You know, so you. Yeah. So it all makes a difference. It does make a difference. I mean, we, we all kind of. And that's the end we of We all kind of know this. Yeah. Right <laughs> so, well, good. So and we got a cool guest coming up. We do have a cool guest. Uh, just, just one more thing. And I, I realize this is. I'm sorry. No, this is going to be um, a little in the past for our listeners, uh, but I just, you know, one more, one more send off in the music world, and and somebody who was, oh yeah, you know, just, I mean, what what an iconic voice, and mm-hmm. it, his versions of some classic songs are classics on their <laughs> own. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we unfortunately had to say goodbye to Joe Cocker. Yes, you know, and oh, man. I mean, some of those bands, Mad Dogs, the Englishman, the, the the talent, not only his talent, but the talent he had behind him mm-hmm. was just insane. So, you know, no, he wasn't a guitar player that I know of, but played Woodstock. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, again, gyrated a, like nobody's business, a legendary performance as all of his were. Yeah. You know? So, um. Yeah, the, a, the band upstairs keeps getting bigger, man. It just keeps getting bigger. It's kind of weird yeah. when you start seeing people that you you know yeah you're like whoa oh, when's my time coming <laughs> <laughs> we don't ask for that we don't ask I understand. for that so but yes we have a we have a very cool guest today yeah um and and quite interesting because started out as a player oh yeah you know started out as a player <laughs> and 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 vocalist mm-hmm. um but that's not the primary reason he's on the show today he's on the show i i thought it would be a good idea to, to have someone that does what he does now on the show so that we could get a different perspective on things. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, from, from someone that doesn't play the gear, mm-hmm. but has to deal with the sounds it makes. Yeah. You know? So I just thought it was a whole different perspective perspective. And, um, well, we've had, we've had the studio guys, right? Drew and Frank and Frank. Right. This is, this is a live situation. now. Yes. And we have not had a front house guy. Right. Yeah. Drew has done front, and so has Frank. Uh, they both have done front house, but but we brought them in uh, as, as a studio as guy. a studio guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So today on our on our episode, we're going to bring in uh, somebody that that we've known, you know, from the way back. I um, follow this guy's career since day. Yeah, one. that that is is a you know he, he travels the world doing front of house now. So um, you know, mm-hmm. without further ado, we shall bring in Mister Brad Divins. <laughs> Hi, this is Carlos Alomar from the David Bowie Band. You're listening to Amps and Axes, the place where it's not what you know, it's how you use it. All right, so we're back, and as promised, Mr. Brad Divins. Brad, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Doing very well, doing very well. This, uh, my, my co-host in crime, uh, Mr. Mick, is here. Say hi, Mick. Hey, man. <laughs> Brad, we've had conversations. Uh, you probably don't remember. Uh, my wife is Colleen Carew. And, uh, and, you know, we've crossed paths, uh, you know, just occasionally at some places where he may be hanging or, or a band would be playing or whatever. And um, back then, it probably would have been uh, Colleen from 98 Rock. Yes. Yeah. And, okay. and, uh, and I followed his career early on. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to, before I was 21, I used to get in a car and drive from Harford County to the Rabbit's Foot out oh in Frederick, Maryland. <laughs> Um, that's a, that's a hike, yeah, it is a hike. um, from oh. Harford County. And, uh, we used to see these guys when they were just Rathchild. Right. And for those of you that don't know, Brad, uh, like I said, he's, he's, he has a different function now, Yes, but he was, uh, also a, a an original member of a band from the East coast called Rathchild, who yeah. later called Rathchild America because of some <laughs> punks in UK. But. <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, the cool thing was, is and I got a couple stories, and then we can go back and dive in like we normally do. Okay, yeah, because I, like, I like to 
You start from the beginning. I, I know. And uh, now I got to see Brad play with Kicks at the Towson Center. Okay. Huh? Because you were on the second album as a guitar player, correct? That's correct. Okay. And then I got to see him headline at Hammerjacks with Wrathchild America, and the opener was Pantera. Yeah. How about that? Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was the craziest show, bar none. Wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, real quick story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Pantera's playing. They shut the power off on them like three or four times because the stage diving was insane. I mean, guys, it was just a stream of guys leaving the stage. Um, but one of the funniest things was uh, a girl uh, got up on stage and uh, tried to take Daryl's pants off and perform, a, a, mm -hmm. you know, a sex act on him uh -huh. while he was playing. And I thought, well, that's different. And then after they got off the stage, uh, you know, uh, Wrathchild America came on. Mm -hmm. And uh, on J's side, which was stage, if you're standing on the stage, left side. So it's stage left. Uh, stage left. Um, a girl got somehow on top of the crowd, got up on the stage. She had a sock for a dress. <laughs> You know those things? You know what I'm talking about? A little yep. tube top. Okay, well, it was around her waist, and there was no underwear or anything, and she was going she was going to go back out into the audience, and she was bent over, and Jay just, boop, hit her in the rear end, <laughs> and she went out, and, you know, just it was just a melee at that time, but I thought... Did he hit her with the headstock of his guitar? No, he just booted her with his boot. Oh, okay, <laughs> and uh, I thought that was the greatest thing ever. It is rock and that. roll, man. It is rock yep. and roll. Uh, let me tell you, uh, Wrathchild America, uh, they put it down uh, better than anybody. I mean, I have seen tons of metal bands, and I saw them God knows how many times. It, it was it was like a, a machine. It was mm -hmm. just perfect every single. It was never a disappointment. Wow, you thanks. know, and and it just I you guys were I just feel like it was one of those things that it they it, it just was at some kind of cusp and they just couldn't get over that edge, right? Because they were like Baltimore's Metallica, yeah. You know, they had that kind of, but they were unique in their own sense, you know. And and Brad was not one of these guys that was like one of these growly screamers. And it was, you know, it was really, it was a different sound. It was really good. And it was heavy. And mm -hmm. I was into it, man, because, you know, I was into the heavy music. So right. it was, it was really a refreshing thing. And I still go back and listen to the old stuff. And, cool. you know, it's, it's vinyl. It's uh, no, 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 it's CD, no. Oh, but okay. it, it's, uh, it's very relevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it, it like, it stands the test of that time, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe, it was a, maybe it was a little just a little bit too different for people to grasp. grasp Maybe I, don't, I, I think I, I thought it was awesome, man. It was just you know. That's because you have an open mind. Yeah, <laughs> and then the Souls at Zero, you know, when they changed mm -hmm. the name, it was just you know. Yeah, we tried to do you know we tried to kind of do the same thing, but just get a little simpler so maybe people would grasp onto it. But then for whatever reason, we were on the wrong label, or you know, management wasn't right, or just something was never. The cards were never all in the. Was never a full hand you know and that, that happens for so many man it's and just like one step away for the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet yeah and just workhorses man mm -hmm. i mean they were out there doing it during well, that rough time too because you know it was like nirvana and stuff you know and, yeah well let's 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 find out yes, where I, where, it, where it came from <laughs> for for mr dimmons when when did it all start and you know because you were uh obviously a, a really good guitar player to play with kicks so you obviously play guitar and bass uh -huh. where did it start and which one did it start on give us a little history on on mr brad devins well it started on guitar when i was i think around 10 years old and the first song that i learned was uh Folsom prison blues by johnny cash ah, <laughs> wow it was that opening riff that hooked me right and you know then from there then i just Started doing the guitar. I started playing guitar when I was 10. Had bands when I was in high school around 15 years old. Nice. I was I was the kid with all the posters from the circus magazine plastered on my wall. <laughs> That's cool. Ed Nugent, Ace Fraley, Joe Perry, Angus Young, Jimmy Page. Yeah. I wanted to be just a little bit of each one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just kept playing in bands through high school. And, and I think what happened with 
the whole kicks thing came about is my band used to open for kicks a lot hmm. and and you know one day i got a call saying hey we're look we need a guitar player and would you like to join so you took and probably ronnie's place i would think i took ronnie's place yeah. yep. you know did that second record cool kids and then yeah cool kids and then the record came out and ronnie came back and i was out <laughs> which was you know whatever live and learn mm. and uh so then i joined Rathchild. Because yeah. those guys used to come and see my band play and would throw business cards at me. Terry and Shannon would. Wow. <laughs> and so the day I got out of kicks, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to call these guys because they were always into me and let's see what happens. And, you know, one thing led to another. And then five years later, after joining that band, we got signed to Atlantic. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That was a lot of hard work for those five years, touring all around the country in a van and trailer and mm. playing five nights a week. Yeah, for sure. No, you could do that back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and there were a lot of venues Living to play. at it enough to pay your bills, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah, man, that's, that's that's where our sights were set. So what? Uh, well, I mean, when you first started playing in your high school bands, what kind of gear were you playing then? Uh, I had a. What did I have back then? I want to say that I had like a Lab Series L11 oh, amp wow. with a maybe a Sun 412 cabinet. Cool. That's and awesome. I had a Fender Telecaster, which I still have to this day. My dad bought it for me. Nice. 74, I believe. Wow. And I had a Les Paul, which I still have to this day as well. I think it's a 78 or 79 Les wow. Paul. Wow. I mean, you know, we all started on the, on the, the Tesco's and the Kimberly's and the, you know, the things like that. And if you, you know, maybe a Dan Electra, if it, that's mm -hmm. half a step. Well, I up, a, I, my acoustic was actually the first thing I started on. That was a Ventura acoustic. I think it was like a hundred bucks, mm -hmm. which I still have too. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's very cool. I have the same 212 PV amp that my dad bought me when he bought the Fender Telecaster. And I've got the receipt. It was bought from Chuck Levins. Ah, oh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Deuce or Mace or? Uh, it was a PB Classic. Oh, Classic. Wow. 212s. Wow. Yep. Very and a Fender cool. Fuzz Wah. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I still got that, too. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm sure that's worth a dollar or two. <laughs> yeah. original rig. That, is, that, <laughs> that is so cool. That is very, very cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of guys, it's like, you know, I had this $50 guitar, you know, and this five watt, you know, mm -hmm. $25 amp to go with it. And, uh -huh. you know, Brad started a couple rungs up on the ladder from there. In a little bit. Well, I was really fortunate. My, like, you know, my parents backed me 100%. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. You know, and I had the acoustic for, I don't know, maybe a couple of years. And then I think we went and saw, I can't remember the name of the band, but there was some band playing some fair or something. And the guy had a, I think he had a black Les Paul. Mm -hmm. Wow, I want to get one of those guitars. Of course, then we went to Chuck Levin's, and the guitar that I saw that I really liked was the Fender Telly. So, oh. you know, my you know my parents they didn't have much, but they, you know, they backed me a hundred percent. That's awesome. That man. is cool. That really, that's they still back me to this day. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. You know, and yeah. and and they're still around, which is even better. Yeah. So, yeah. wow. All right, so we're into uh, Rathchild and all this time. I I guess you're playing guitar and then yeah well kicks i play guitar yeah. obviously started in wrathchild playing guitar and singing oh. and wrathchild the original incarnation of wrathchild was a three guitar lineup mm. and so you know we did this thing where we trade off leads on all different songs and everything and then i started putting the guitar down every now and then and just fronting and so i did that for a while and i was still playing guitar in a couple of songs and then uh we ended up, I think we were getting ready to go out on tour again in the van and trailer doing a club circuit. And our bass player wasn't able to go for whatever reason, which mm. we didn't find out until like a couple of days before. Ugh. Wow. And, and and we're like, well, well, fuck it. I'll play guitar. <laughs> I'll play bass. Yeah. And so we had his gear in a van. So we went out and I picked up the bass and figured it all out on the fly. And we just went for it. <laughs> so it, it kind of stuck we're like you know what we started writing a couple of tunes while we were gone and like i guess this is how it's going to be i'll just play bass that's so, cool yeah so, it obviously worked that's yeah. yeah i mean I, I i liked fronting but there was always something weird about when you're not singing what do you do yeah, yeah. so you know i strapped the bass on and i'm like well this is way more comfortable 
Yeah, especially if you come up playing an instrument. It's like, what are my hands supposed to do? Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, when I'm not holding a mic or, you know, yeah. motioning to the crowd or the band or whatever. It's, I just and feel stupid. I got to think here. I got I to go in my, uh, my heavy metal uh, locker here. Morbid Angel, I think the bass player sings, right? Am I correct with that, Brad? Mm, I'm not sure. I think I think I saw. <laughs> I I they opened up for uh, uh, Pantera, and it was uh, it was uh, Sepultura, uh, Morbid Angel, Nothing Face, Nothing and, Face, and and and, pa- and Pantera. This was uh, the Steel uh, reinventing the Steel tour, mm-hmm. and and I swear when Morbid Angel was up there, I saw Satan. <laughs> <laughs> because that was the scariest band ever <laughs> oh, that's funny as hell a lot of red lights and a lot of growling <laughs> so how long did um how long did Wrathchild go for until uh you were no longer playing with them oh that was 83 to what 92 was Wrathchild. Yeah. okay Okay. And then 92, we did a new demo that we started shopping, and we decided to change our name, and it became Souls at Zero. Yep. And I think we played a show at Hammerjacks where we played as Wrathchild and then a set as Souls at Zero. Wow. So it was kind of like, cool. okay, let's we're saying goodbye to Wrathchild, say hello to Souls at Zero. It was, it, it was very interesting. Hmm. Huh. Even, but, you know, we felt that we, we kind of felt like the name – we just couldn't get, we could never get over having to add the America to the name. Mm-hmm. It's never set right. And it was always embarrassing to say. And then we're like, you know what? Let's try to move on from this and see if maybe it, we get a clean start. Yeah. Of course, you know, that went on for a few years. And then it just, you know, the business kind of kept us down. And it didn't really, it changing the name was a good thing for us spiritually and mentally. But as far as like a business move, it wasn't the greatest because nobody knew who Souls of Zero was. It's like right. starting over. Exactly. It didn't have the momentum and, that and Wrathchild. Yep. And the thing that sucked was that UK band had broken up years before, right? Yeah. But you couldn't oh, you man. couldn't get rid of that. Yeah, they had to keep it because there was still that trademark thing or whatever. Yep. Wow. And I mean, Atlantic kind of screwed us in the beginning because they're just like, you know what? This is your problem. You deal with it. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, there you go. Like they didn't have a lawyer or two to belly up to the we bar. All thought, Look, you're Atlantic Records and there's some little dipshit band from the UK. Can't you bury them? <laughs> give, give them some cash and let's go on about our business. But it wasn't like that. Uh, wow. So, well, the real heavy, the, the real heavy bands weren't getting all that fair of a shake. During, no. those, during those early years mm-hmm. they were signing a lot of bands yeah and they were a lot of hair bands that were more radio friendly doing you know uh you know the ballads and stuff during those those 80s those late 80s oh, yeah. and early 90s power and, ballads put a lot of those bands on the map and then you know that little band from texas pantera came through and everybody went what the hell exactly <laughs> you know i mean those guys paved a big road for a lot of these guys because yeah nobody had ever heard that stuff mm-hmm. you know and these guys were right there that was the thing they were yeah. right on we that cusp right there with them yeah. yeah absolutely they were best friends with those guys yeah <laughs> and that tour was the one where you know it was a co-headlining tour with them and us and yeah. we thought you know we felt pretty confident that things were going to happen but you know wow. like you say it happens to a lot of bands yeah that was just, a just fell the other way yeah. if anybody saw that that they, tour that had they, a hell of a tour oh my god it was a great tour we yeah. had a great time it was it was it was wow. crazy guitar riffs just you know just a lot of just balls in mm-hmm. that show and to see that back to back you know you got pantera and and wrathchild and you're going hey, who you know this was crazy yeah because it was like two power bands man that were that were heavy right, right. And, very parallel and you know yeah yeah, yeah. i was like a little schoolboy because i was like <laughs> you know i was into that well, I mean, you know, they had to be considered on, on the, you know, on parallel on the same plane uh, during that time. If the tour was actually billed as like a co-headlining tour, you know, yeah, that was like, you know, when when Stevie Ray and Jeff Beck went out, you know, mm-hmm. they they would just that was a co-headlining tour, and they yeah. would they would trade opening spots every night and you know closing spots and yep, you know, so they're, everybody considers that you know those bands are equal, mm-hmm. you know. It's the tail end of uh, the uh, Cowboys from Hell tour for them. Yep, it was the beginning of our when we released 3d mm. yeah so that was cool. yeah. wow <laughs> yeah well unfortunate that it didn't work yeah. out but you know that all th- everything happens for a reason 
Exactly, exactly. So Souls at Zero for a few years. Yeah, Souls at Zero till I believe it was 95. Yep. Did two records and an EP for Energy Records. And then I got this bright idea that we should go to St. Croix with some acoustic guitars and, and a tape recorder and see if we couldn't write some songs down there. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, me and Terry were just playing in this bar on, uh, it was like a little outdoor bar in St. Croix for six or seven weeks we went down there. And that was pretty much the end of the band. Because <laughs> <laughs> we didn't really get any writing done and it kind of just all fell apart. And I'm like, you know, this, maybe it's just time to go and do something different. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know if you remember Mike Combs, who had Back Alley Gators. Oh, okay. Who was also the singer in Strong Arm. Nice. And Shannon was in L.A. at the time because he had moved out there to join Ugly Kid Joe. Yes. Yeah. So they started calling me like, hey, what are you doing? You know, why don't you come to L.A.? We're going to do this thing called Back Alley Gators. You know, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then the longer I thought about it, I'm like, well, why shouldn't I go? There's nothing here anymore. Souls of Zero is done. Maybe it's time to move on. And then I moved to L.A. Mm-hmm. And we, did a, we did a record with Back Alley Gators that got shelved. Because the label said we don't know what to do with this. It was a three-piece rockabilly ska band, like almost right. Yeah, I call it. It was like ACDC meets Motorhead meets the Stray Cats. <laughs> it's exactly what it was like. That is awesome. <laughs> that's that's great. It was as powerful as Wrathchild was in a little different way. Wow. It was, th- it was three people up there just fucking throwing it down. That is so cool. That's very cool. I've only yeah. heard about this. I've never, I've never heard this part. Any of that available anywhere? It's well, I have a copy of it. It's not available, but if you guys want to hear it, I'd be glad to send you something. Oh hell yeah, <laughs> cool! Because it weird. never got released, and wow, you know, I don't. We can't really do anything with it because you know Mike is dead. He passed away. Mm. Oh. and there's some probably some legal ramifications to why we can never release it, but I don't see any reason why people can't play it. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, man, that would be For awesome. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, because I'd heard that, that he was like, I'd heard, you know, how the rumors are, right? Mm-hmm. So I'd heard that you went out and you joined a ska band. <laughs> and it I was like. Ska. No, it was, it was, when you hear it, you'll, it was definitely not ska. Yeah, but you know how it is. When oh, yeah. the story gets bent five different ways. And by the time oh, yeah. it gets back to you, you're like, <laughs> so he's in a, he's in a Christian band. He's playing classical music <laughs> now. You know, <laughs> yeah. So I heard it and I was like, you know, and then nothing then nothing right yeah, it yeah. just it, it, it was nothing there and then yeah, um, because we you know we i went out there we did the record i think we went to europe for three weeks with ugly kid joe on one of their tours and did there was some skateboarding thing over there mm-hmm. we did austria and a couple other countries and then we came back and the record was supposed to get released and that's when we found out that there was no deal and they weren't releasing it and mm-hmm. so we continued to do showcases around la and it looked like something was going to happen because i mean it was it was different, but it was so cool when you saw the show because it was just three of us up there. And it was, you know, one minute, it's kind of like ACDC. The next minute, it's, you know, Stray Cats, Reverend Horton Heat, twangy vocal kind of thing. And wow, it was just really cool. And yeah. it was really powerful. We I mean, Shannon this. was behind the kit, so you know what that's like. Oh, oh yeah. For sure. Yeah, Shannon is a monster. Well, so. I'm looking forward to hearing this, man. This is This really piques my interest. Yeah. That is great. That is great. <laughs> so you're in L.A. for a while. Yep. Um, doing this. Yep. So I'm in L.A. And now I'm in L.A. needing to pay my rent. And mm-hmm. I'm like, what am I going to do now? Here, like, We can do these showcases. But, you know. And then a friend of mine was like, hey, there's a band looking for a tour manager. There was a band on the second stage of Lollapalooza called Agnes Gooch. Hmm. And he's like, why don't you go meet their manager? And I'm thinking, you know what? I just toured the States countless times in a van and trailer with my band, taking care of everybody. There's no reason why I can't take care of some other people and not be have the responsibility of being on stage. <laughs> so I went to meet the guy, and he's like, yeah, we're, you know, we're looking for a tour manager, and can you mix? And I'm like, yeah, I can do that too. And I, you know, I had never done it on that level. Mm-hmm. But I've just, I knew that I had to, I just had to go for it. Yet another case of baptism by fire, man. How many times yeah, I mean, do you hear like, this you from know, people? I work for you know? sound companies. I've done stuff in the studio. I know the. I know what the concept of mixing a show is all about, and I know what I want to hear. Mm-hmm. I'm just not exactly sure how I get to that point. Like, how do I make it? You know, how do I make that happen? Yeah. 
you know, and I just get out there and I just did it. I just learned along the way and I asked questions and I wasn't afraid to say, you know what, I don't know what I'm doing here. Can you show me? Mm. And, you know, when you are honest and open with people, it's amazing what you can learn. Wow. As opposed Man, to just great. trying to be like, oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. And then failing. Mm hmm. You yeah. know, so, and, and then people thinking you're a wise ass for turning down their help, you know. And, yeah. Yeah. So there I am. There. What's that? Two th that's 1996, I think, was that gig. Or 97, maybe, was when I did that. Mm -hmm. Three years later, I'm doing front of house for Lincoln Park. Hmm. Wow. So I'm doing Lincoln Park. And then, you know, after that, I think I did, I did some Kid Rock stuff. I did this band called Him. Counting Crows, Cindy Lauper, Bob Seeger. I mean, it's just gone on and on. Wow. And at one point, I'm like, there was a one point where I was just starting to mix and tour manage and still would go back to LA and do showcases because I still wanted to be on stage. Cool. And at some point, I'm, I said to myself, I'm like, all this other stuff is happening and I'm not even trying. I was never set out, I never set out to be a front of house engineer. Mm hmm. And then it starts happening. I'm like, maybe this is the way I'm supposed to go. You know, mm. so I just kind of went with it. And here I am now I'm mixing front of house for Enrique Iglesias. Wow. <laughs> I mean, crazy. and I, I'm like, how did I get here? <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, you know, sometimes you just got to let go of the reins. Well, yeah, because otherwise, I mean, I, I wouldn't have cared if I would have been playing clubs for the rest of my life. But I wanted a little more than that because, you know, I wanted a family. I wanted things, and you know, and sure. Yeah, so, man. and 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 the fact was that it was it was going so well, and I mean, I, I figured out how to, you know, I must have figured out how to do it, <laughs> or I'm really good at faking it still. <laughs> but, yeah, but you know, you know, when something goes that well, I mean, how do you just turn your back on it? And go, nah, I want to go back to playing bars. You know, well, that's just it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and it's it's ever bit as as rewarding as being on stage, it's just, a, it's, it's different because now I'm on the other side, but yet I'm still responsible for being for the creative part of the show and, and making sure people enjoy what they're hearing and having a good time. And, you know, yeah, I'm just behind the scenes, but I mean, but I have a gig that cannot fail. Yeah. Yeah. The audio cannot fail. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, so, that's, that's a, maybe a little bit more uh, of a large responsibility than being one of four guys on stage or five yeah. guys on stage or something, you know? Yeah. He's like the hand of God. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, I love it. I, I love what I'm doing. So. Yeah. I mean, you're still involved in the music industry and you know, yeah. I mean, it's a wonderful industry, man, no matter what part of it you're in. It's great. Yeah. That's what I know. So yeah. that's what I do. Yeah. You know, and I've gotten to mix <clears throat> some studio stuff. I've got to do a lot of broadcast stuff. I work for a band called garbage, you know, oh, yeah. exactly. Back, which exactly. I mean, that's Butch Vig. And yeah. You know, mm. that was a that was probably one of the best gigs I ever had to now, earn respect and trust of that man. Oh, for sure, you know? for sure. Wow, that's uh, yeah. There's um, there's a lot going on with that guy. Yeah, I mean, there's another one of those things. I'm sitting in the in the rehearsal space before the tour starts, and I'm thinking, I'm mixing Butch Vig. <laughs> He's gonna come walking in here any minute. To, he wants to listen to my interpretation, you know, because we're rec tracking and. I'm mixing and doing playback and all that. And he, I'm like, he's going to come in here and want to hear what I'm, how I'm mixing his band. Like I'm just like sweating and nervous. And, mm -hmm. and then he walks in and it's like, this is so cool. <laughs> I get here working with Butch Big. That, yeah. That's awesome. I mean, you know, you're, you're mixing the band that he invented and, exactly. you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a ton of stuff going on on stage track wise and everything I would imagine with. Oh, with there's a lot going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yep. when you when you let me just back up just a little bit when you first started um were were you or the industry like headlong into digital consoles at that point or did you start on analog and then have to learn your way into digital yeah i started on analog okay i thought so yep started on analog learned every analog desk there was because some you know most of the bands early on we would never carry anything you just roll into a club and mix on whatever they had mm-hmm mm -hmm. And then later on, when I, I think when I did Lincoln Park, then obviously we started carrying consoles. <clears throat> and then uh, the the sound company for that was uh, Claire Brothers. Wow. Actually, it was Shoko at the time. Mm -hmm. And they had a console that was actually a digitally 
digitally controlled analog desk. Hmm. So that was my first, uh, my first uh, run in with a digital desk to where, you know, I mean, analog, everything is laid out in front of you. Each right. channel strip is the same right? from the mic pre all the way down to the fader. Yeah. On a digital desk, you have like a master section where your compressor, limiter, gate, EQ, everything is on this section and you have each channel that you select. Mm -hmm. You and have to kind of bust that. into that, I guess. Yeah, so it's a, it was a totally different thing, but you know, it was one of those things where once you get it, then you you know, and everyone starts going to digital. It's like you just make the transition. Yeah. And, I, I know, so that's where I've been since two thousand seven. I guess wow. that's got. To, I guess that's got to be different because you can't, or can you? I I don't know. I mean, can you lay your hands on like you know four different faders at once for? Well, you can on yeah because you have twenty four like the console I use is an Avid profile. Okay. And you have 24 faders in front of you with a eight fader VCA section. So you, you've always got the faders, but it's all the other little things that you can't really grab. I can't, I can't grab. Well, I probably could, but I, I was thinking two different sends for two different channels, but you know, there, you can do that, but there are certain things you can't change the EQ and the kick drum and the, and the lead vocal at the same time. Mm. Okay. You know, that's a little tricky to do because you still have to select that channel to get there. Right. And you can have scenes, right? You can have, yeah. the, they can, so you, you have 24 faders, which looks like 24 tracks, mm -hmm. but it can be God knows how many deep. Oh, yeah. I mean, so there's can, 24 faders on the on the top layer. Yeah. So you has, can pull up. The desk up. has four layers. Yeah. Oh, okay. So see, you're, yeah. he's dealing yeah. with 96 tracks, mm -hmm. and but you got to pull them up. Right. It's almost like it's just a matter so, of selecting the bank. Yeah, it's the, a little yeah. different thought process going from analog to digital. But once you get it, it's yeah, you the, know, and you realize that you can take your show on a USB key, mm -hmm. load it into Jesus. another desk, and away you go. And you yeah. don't carry racks full of it, you know, analog outboard gear with you. That's cool. Yeah, I've I've seen that happen a lot. Where you know, the, yeah. a band will come into a club, like you know, maybe uh, Ramshead downtown or something, mm -hmm. and you know, the guy will have everything. Uh, on a USB drive and just plug it into the board and that's cool. there's a ton of stuff that's already preset for him. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, my whole show is on a USB key. Wow. All the, the my whole plug-in package is on a USB key, all that software and the authorizations I carry with me on an iLock. So my, my whole show is I can carry in my pocket. Wow. I go to, you know, I don't have to carry a console anymore. I mean, we do when we do like a two-week U.S. run, but if we do one-offs and stuff, the console gets provided. I show up, load in all my stuff, and away we go. Is that pretty universal? That console is universal, yeah. That's wow. nice. I get it everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm thinking uh, ease of, of execution-wise, you, you're used to this and you kind of like it and it, it's easy for you to work with now. Uh, but... Sound wise, do you prefer it? Do you think it's as good? What's what's your thought on that? I mean, there are there are arguments that you know analog sounds much better than digital, and you know it's like my philosophy is I'm going to turn that knob until the until I like the way it sounds. So for me, if I like if the desk I'm using, I like the sound of the mix that I'm doing, then there's really not a comparison issue. Because I'm happy with what I'm doing. Okay. I, get there's, that. I mean, I'm sure, yeah, there's other desks that are going to sound different. You know, the mic pre's are different on every desk. Some add color, some don't add anything at all, which is the beauty of the Avid desk is that it doesn't add anything. So it allows me to use plugins and I can construct, my console can be a combination of a Neve, an API, SSL. Hmm. You know, I can have my own hybrid desk. Wow. That's so, so cool. <laughs> but, the, but I mean, I like the way things sound that I mix on this console. So for me, it's, you know, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. No looking back then. And that's great. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was just curious about that. I was like, you know, because yeah. I'm sure there are some guys out there who go, you know, this is, this is great and I can get what I want and I'm happy with what I get. But God, I used to love the way those analog boards used to sound, you know, and there's, there's old school for every aspect of, oh, yeah. Of all yeah, this business. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Now, speaking of old, old school, I mean, and this is called Amps and Axes. So uh, I wanted to take your perspective uh, and throw it up to stage now. And okay. do you prefer working with live amps on stage or do you prefer ISO or do you do you prefer uh, a virtual I mean, what's what's your take on that whole thing now? I, there, I imagine you've worked with all of it by now. I've worked with, I've worked with all of it. Yeah. Mm. So now that's a that's a tough one because I mixed Motley Crue for a while as well. Okay. Now Jeez. you got to have amplifiers with Motley Crue. You got to have cabinets on stage. Yeah. You know, I, I would hope. I would hope. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The cult. You got to have amps on stage. Mm -hmm. But then I did do a band like Garbage where there was no amps whatsoever. It was all these pod HD pros. Wow. Mm -hmm. The whole there was only thing that was on stage was a drum kit and Shirley's vocal mic. Yeah. So in that regard, I could roll into any venue, whether it was, you know, the rabbit's foot or it was Madison Square Garden, and it, the mix would sound exactly the same every time because I had the consistency of everything being programmed in the digital domain. Right. And I wasn't fighting any amplifiers or any backline noise coming off the stage. So in that regard, I really enjoyed mixing that way because it was, it was like mixing a record every night. Hmm. But on the other side... You take a band like Molly Crew or The Cult or, you know, Lincoln Park, anybody who has amplifiers on stage, there's a certain element to that whole, just the whole feel and the vibe that you get from having live instruments, live amplifiers, and a sound that you get because of it. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I there's no way I would disagree with that, you know, and I think, sure. um, I mean, we've talked to a lot of people who really prefer to have that behind them and the interaction that yeah. it breeds between the uh, the amp and the guitar and hence the, the performer of course and and the performance is affected mm -hmm. yep you know and other guys are like i i just if it's if it's good in my in ear i don't care what's going on anywhere you know and <laughs> yeah we've had those guys too absolutely. absolutely but there is a certain feeling of having a marshall stack behind you oh for sure well we'll you know that from here. just you know <laughs> having the personal experience of it yeah and you're not going to get that from you know, a digital amp with in ears. That's just not going to happen. Right. So that comes down to a feel thing for the player. So, so I, you know, I guess. You know, it, but, it, but with a band like Garbage, there was no way they could, ha there would be no way to duplicate. We had, there, there were some songs that had six different guitar tones in it. Anything mm -hmm. from clean to o completely overdriven to just like bizarre sounds. Yeah. So it was easier for us to, you know, everything was programmed. You know, we had the consistency of those exact same sounds every night at the same point in the song. Yeah, I, well, I guess if you're looking for a, a perfect performance. Or just it, being able to duplicate what you're trying to do that you did on the record. Now mm -hmm. you want to do it live. Yeah. You know, ISO cabinets. I, I think there was ISO. Nikki Six had his bass cabinets ISO'd and there was mic phones in there. And, you know, yeah. it gives you the separation. You don't have to worry about any bleed into the microphone when you use ISO boxes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really consistent as well. And you're not fighting the stage volume. Right, right. Especially yeah. with vocal mics and everything. So, yep. yeah. I, you know, and again, with ISOs, you know, if you're the player, you're relegated to either monitors or in-ears or whatever is happening. And, you yeah, know. because even with the ISO cabs, I mean, they're off stage somewhere. So you're not feeling that at your back either. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Of course. You know, unless you got wedges or something, and you know, in which case it's kind of the same, but not really. Yeah, it's going to sound totally different. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it it is different. I mean, at least it doesn't blow into the into the mic, but you know, it's yep. it's a different I'm, thing. Depending yeah. on the environment that I'm mixing in, you know, I can pretty much adapt to anything. So, I mean, when I mixed the cult, Billy Duffy's had a, you know, a big. He had a raging rig. Yeah. I'm mixing in front of house. He's on house right, stage left. Mm -hmm. I would have to set front of house up at house left just to get away from his guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it sounded that was the cold. It had to. It that's what it was supposed to be like. Yeah. You know, yeah. So in which case, I just moved over to house left and 
then I didn't have as much guitar in my face and I was able to bring it up into PA. So nice. Yeah. I, you know, I, I guess, you know, there are certain types of music that you can, you can get away with, with doing direct or, you know, modeled or, you know, whatever. There um, are, I mean, the Kemper amp is a prime example of a good modeling amp. Yeah. Yep. They, uh, you know, uh, and especially you can do it especially if like in the case of garbage and things all of that is is kind of the the, the music is made that way in the first place I exactly guess is what i'm trying to say so that's how it was created right right so replicating it i mean it could be nothing short of almost perfect on any given night you know but taking somebody who's used to a, a full back line behind them and you know, th those those are the guys that have, I think, the the hardest time with it because you know, if you, even if it's ISO, um, it, virtual is even harder. But even if it's ISO, it's like, well, there's no feel anymore. Yeah. You know. Yep. But uh, and those types of bands are used to you know playing together in a room with amplifiers blaring. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so. As was Rathchop. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we were first in a concrete basement. <laughs> Hell yeah. Otherwise, I I can even hear. <coughs> mm -hmm. and they had that little two-headed guitar monster uh you know terry and jay uh, exactly and uh oof, no they were smart quiet no not at all <laughs> right nope <laughs> and shannon was definitely not quiet on those drums so. oh my god no 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 we, yeah. we had seen him a couple of years ago when godsmack came through oh he's amazing to watch yeah yeah he was crazy and then, i remember the, when i when i first actually went and saw him play with godsmack and i was in the audience and i at one point i was just I was almost in tears because I couldn't believe that I used to play in front of that guy. So, <laughs> that's what people were seeing. Oh, yeah. Like, Jesus, he's so good. Yeah, it, it, it was really like, wow. And then Watching he and, him is amazing. And then he, and, really he and Sully do the, the double drum thing. Oh, yeah. At one part, yeah. It's, it's yeah. pretty cool. But yeah. any, um, Brad, any desire to get back into picking up a, a six, four or six string instrument at any time? Well, it's always a desire. There's actually been some conversations had about this very thing. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's, you, I can't say that we're going to do it, but I'm definitely going to say, can't say that we're not going to do it. For 100% say, what am I trying to say here? I'm getting a little <laughs> Now, now the, 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 the we. I think there's a chance that something may happen in the future. Cool. And, and the we you're referring to? The we I'm referring to would be me, Shannon, Jay, and Terry. Get the hell wow. out of here. Very nice. That's cool. I mean, we've been talking and, you know, timing is an issue because of what Shannon and I do. And, you mm -hmm. know, Jay and Terry are busy as well. And we all want to do it. So that's, that's very a cool. step in the right direction. And we all agree that it's got to be the four of us or we're not going to do it. So. Well, wanting to all for you wanting to do. I mean, that's the first big step. Now, that's you know? the first big step. Exactly. Absolutely. Now, I got to I got to ask because okay. I, I did a little research. And Jay plays in a band up in New York, right? Well, actually, I think he used to, but now he's down in Florida. Oh, okay. So he's down, him and Terry are both near Shannon down there. Oh. And Terry's playing in like a, he was playing in a country act band, but I'm not sure if he's still doing that or not. I think he might be. Terry's one of those guitar players, man. Amazing. He can play anything. <laughs> amazing guitar player, blind as a bat. Yep. <laughs> one time. Because he used to, he didn't wear sun, he didn't wear glasses on stage, uh -huh. uh -uh. right? And one time, he was trying to hand me uh, a pick off the side of the stage, and literally was nowhere near me. <laughs> I was like, and then well, my, been blind uh, with alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was probably a, it was probably a two step thing, you know. He, and my one friend goes, uh, uh, a good buddy of mine. He said, he goes, yeah, man, he he doesn't have his glasses on. He can't see shit. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the case. No glasses and beer goggles. You there know? you go. There you go. That'll do it to you. Mm -hmm. Jay Jay played a Jay played a Strat. Yep. And Terry played a Flying V, right? Yeah, he played a Flying V. He had a several Gibsons. I think he had a. He had a Les Paul as well. Yep. But Flying V was like his main thing. Yeah. Nice. The whole yeah. Hetfield thing. Michael Shanker you know. was one of his big uh, influences. Shanker, yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah, they do. They did a version of Pink Floyd's Time. Was it? Yep. Amazing. Mm. And they did it 
it, it was it that was one of those covers that was you know it was definitely like a um uh, an homage or something to to Pink Floyd. Mm-hmm. We tried but, to do it as close, you know, to the original as we could. I'll but have, it still sound. It, I mean, it had the Rathchild touch to it. Of yeah. course, it's a little heavier, but that was yeah. a great version of that song. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, of course, uh, I'm not just I'm not drunk. I'm just drinking. Uh huh. <laughs> oh yeah. That's a good one too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I can't wait to hear the. Um, the AC DC rock um, uh, rockabilly uh, yeah th- th- <laughs> motorhead motorhead yeah, yeah. <laughs> give me your email address or whatever and I'll just give you a Dropbox link a Dropbox link sure oh, that'd yeah, be that, great that's man. happening <laughs> <laughs> oh, that absolutely is, that is absolutely. definitely happening man cool well uh, Shannon um, I mean Brad why do they say Shannon <laughs> I, I want to thank you for being on the show and but is there anything else that you want to plug any like dates that you're trying to pump for any artists that you're working at any future projects anything you got going recording wise and anything at all that uh, you want well to- i'm actually in the process of uh putting together a home studio and i'm looking for projects to mix oh wow so that's going to be my next little thing that i dive into and you're located close to us yeah yeah i'm in hagerstown maryland ah, okay hagerstown my boys I, up there. I went full circle. <laughs> I started here when I when I joined Kicks, and for somehow I got back here. I, and I moved everywhere from Hagerstown to Virginia to Ellicott City to three times around L.A. Back wow. to Annapolis to Columbia, and and I end up here. It's crazy. Wow. Full circle. Well, the ride won't be so bad for me anymore. I live now in Carroll County, so that's, that's yeah. true. That's true. Right and you know, I mean, you can you can leave for Looking a tour for from anywhere to, to mix. So you know, I guess people could hit me up on Facebook. Sure, we'll you know, uh, we'll put a link out stuff, there for you. Get a web page up and running, but okay. You know, now that I've gotten to the point where I'm mixing, you know, front of house for an artist, I I actually have some time for myself now. Oh, good, nice. I'm. I mean, I've pretty got, pretty much got to the point in my career where I'm fortunate enough to be able to pick and choose. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm trying to get, I'm, I want to be more, spend more time at home and get a business going here for myself. And, you know, I want to get back into the studio and playing and producing and that sort of thing. Awesome. Cool. So, Good. Congratulations, man. Good on you. And and not to uh, not to end things, but uh, with uh, Drew, Drew Missouri. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Those guys did a lot of the, most of their stuff, right? Was done yeah. out of Drew's studio. Yeah, well, we we did a lot of Drew and I actually did a lot of stuff in, in his studio and then Oz Studios when it was around. Yeah. Oh yeah. We did all three. Yeah, we did all three Souls at Zero records at Oz. Wow. Yep. Yeah. I remember them, but we used to rehearse there when they were building the place. You know, yeah. Joe Goldsboro and, and yeah. company and Steve and Steve. Yeah. That was a great studio. Yeah, it was. And we would record for 16 hours and then pass out in the lounge for four or five and then get up and do it again. (laughs) We lived at that place. Yeah, that was a great place, man. Good old days. Yeah. It's not like that anymore. It's hard (laughs) to keep studios running anymore. I don't think it is. And who knew that when you walked out of the out of that studio if you went left you ended up in an episode of the wire yeah. <laughs> oh that's for sure that's for sure thank thank god they had the uh the big garage doors where you pull in and then load out <laughs> yeah exactly yeah you don't want to be doing that outside it was a bit scary but you know we survived it no for sure for sure yeah, man yep. that was awesome well, Brad, thank you again so much, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, you get us the information. We'll put your uh, your link up, Facebook page, whatever. Yeah, we'll, if you get a um, yeah, a, I got a LinkedIn page as well. Cool. cool. Yeah. If you, we'll, if you get a, a website up and running, let us know. You know, after the fact, and we'll we, make we, sure. we can attach it to absolutely. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. He's he's the tech guy. I don't, I don't know what we can do and what we can't, but yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Oh my God! Yeah. Yeah, it was good. I, I loved it. Thank you. This is the great greatest way for me to start the year off. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I, I this was a total surprise to me. Well, I have to tell you that I haven't done an interview regarding Wrathchild or Souls at Zero or Kicks or, or anything in many, many years. This is actually the first. Well, nice. <laughs> That's so, cool. Glad to be the first and glad to um, glad to put out there that there's a little chit chat going on about, you know, 
playing again and yeah this is crazy I'm totally happy to to you know <laughs> put out there that you want to you looking for projects to mix any any particular genre you you want to uh do or want to stay away from or you know i would be inclined to to listen to anything okay, okay. i mean i'd like to think that i could mix just about anything i mean i've mixed rock uh i actually am working with uh <laughs> You know, because I'm mixing Enrique at the moment, and we just did a tour with Pitbull, and I'm working with Pitbull's engineer on some projects, and that's completely, I mean, that's all, you know, Pitbull and Enrique are, that's music that I never ever thought that I'd ever be into or doing anything with. Mm -hmm. wow. But, you know, we're actually mixing stuff in that vein. So, nice. you know, of a Latin flavor with a lot of percussion and horns. And so, well, you know, might, I mean, we... my roots are in rock, but. You know, I like all music. We we might be seeing more of that with the whole Cuban thing, you know. So right. We'll, we'll see how that goes. I I love Latin music. I just love Latin music. You know, it's it's way different. It was, I mean, I mean, it's all music to me. But mm -hmm. you know, when I got I got a actually I got a Facebook message from his producer saying, "Hey, he's looking for a new uh, engineer. Would you like to try out?" And I'm like, Enrique and Glace, like, how did you find? <laughs> right. <laughs> Send me a Facebook message. <laughs> Uh, wow. He found me because oh, I had done funny. this video uh, on the you know Waves plugins. I did a video on their site for when I was working with Garbage. He's like, "That's where I found you." That is crazy, wow. you know. And I'm I don't have any I don't have anything on my resume that's anything at all like Enrique's music. Mm -hmm. But you know the fact that I did Garbage and I work with tracks and a band and it was appealing to them and here I am four months later I'm still there so. Dude, that's awesome, man. It it, it, see, uh, once again, another, you just never know. I mean, how many how many people you talk to that never saw that left turn coming? Plus, no, the, I never saw it. And, and the whole time, I'm thinking, you know, he kept. He's like, "Can you come out to do mix this show?" And I'm like, "No, I can't," because I was working with other acts at the time. Mm -hmm. And finally, I get out there and I mixed a couple of shows, and I'm like, "Okay, well, this is cool." And they're never going to call me. <laughs> and sure enough, they did. They're like, "We want you." And I'm like. This is wild because now I'm mixing Enrique. Wow, yeah, man, that's killer. That and, is just it, killer. you know, like I say, it's music that, like I say, there's nothing like that on my resume. So just for the fact that they took a chance on me in that regard, mm -hmm. you know, most acts want to see that you have, you know, they, uh, I would have thought he'd have wanted to see that I have Ricky Martin or Jennifer Lopez or something that's in that vein. Sure, mm -hmm. but you know, he liked the he actually liked the fact that I was a musician. Wow, you know, you know that's. That, I mean, there's something to be said for that because yeah, I mean, that, even Butch said to me, "That's the whole reason we hired you was because you were a musician." Wow, we knew you'd get it, and I'm like, "Wow, that's really cool," because wow. I oftentimes think that people that mix that are musicians have a whole different vibe about the mix mm -hmm. than if you were just you know a, an engineer that learned your skill just as an engineer. Right, right. Out of school and, you know, sure. by the book. And yeah, yeah. it's yeah, it's a whole different ear if you're a musician. Oh, it really yeah. is. Yeah. Re, so I will mix anything. How's that? Is that that's that's there the you answer go. you're looking for, right? <laughs> you know, again, that, that falls back into just say yes. Yeah, exactly. Just, just say yes. Just say yes. You know? Figure it out later. That's it. <laughs> you just got you just got to make a trek to Hagerstown and you can get it done. Well, you know, we're, we're on, you know, we're digital now. We can, yep. you know. Send Pro Tools sessions over over the internet. There you go. All I kinds mean, of stuff we can do nowadays. I mean, you know how Jason works, man. He, you know, yes. He he sends stuff to Marco Miniman, and <laughs> you know they never see each other. No, hey. he does entire albums without seeing the other guys yep. on the album. <laughs> yep, so that's, that's crazy. the way it goes, man. That's, I've that's... mixed tracks for bands that you know I got the tracks, I've mixed them, I sent them back to them, and they're done. That's it. Mm -hmm. That is, it's a different world, man. It is, it's a totally different world. And I'm glad people are figuring out how to survive in it. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's the world after major studio and, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, major. The options are limitless now. There's, I mean, there's many different ways you can do something. Yeah. Sure. Oh, have yeah. to go to the studio, even though I am a firm believer in the fact that if you play with three or four other people, it's a whole lot better experience. Then if you try to do something on oh, your own. The juice is there. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, you put the people in the same room or at All least in the same building. And let them play and get it down on tape. Yep, yep. Hey, you know, if you, you guys get back together, you could probably get away with calling it Wrathchild now. We yeah. probably could. Yeah. I can't see us calling it Wrathchild America if we do it again. 
Could yeah. you? Could you imagine? <laughs> that would, that, that, that you, would just be like not the, like the, police in anything. So right, that would be the biggest insult if you if after all these years you yeah. still wound up having to call. Oh, it that would salad. suck. The, the thing that pissed you off the most, you <laughs> still got to go back to. Yeah, but that would but suck. Could you imagine? I think I would say we're Rothschild. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. right. Come after us. <laughs> could you imagine? them releasing a new i i would be Look, like dude i'm i'm seeing it all come this back this would be the most we, awesome we just, thing we just went and saw the boys from hagerstown saturday man and i mean completely sold out packed mm-hmm. you know for, oh, yeah. for merry kicksmas yeah. yeah those guys are, are are i mean they're they're as good as they were what 20 years ago or mm-hmm. something they exactly freaking, they freaking look the same steve still sounds the same sure. vocally it's insane i don't know how he does it but he sure does i don't so know just, man it's crazy take those five guys off put those other four guys in the place yeah. in the same building so, and i guarantee it'll be packed at a rafter absolutely absolutely have, have you spoken to eddie trunk lately no <laughs> you know i've never spoken to him you Actually. know, I think he had a lot to do with putting kicks back on the map. And, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, somehow we got to put these two together if, if this happens. Oh, so, yeah. Stay in touch. Well, Vinny Paul knows him and they know Vinny, so they could. they could. Oh, well, yeah, OK. There you know, you they could totally get to talk to Eddie Trunk. There's no yeah. way. He would love it. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. It could happen somehow if we wanted it to. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Well, how cool is this, man? Happy New Year to everybody. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Happy know. holidays to y'all as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. And and <laughs> thank you very much again. We'll do uh we'll put all the information up uh when this episode comes out. Yes. Okay. And uh you know, stay in touch and let us know what's going on. We'll we're happy to put an addendum up now and then. So yeah. we'll do. Yeah, yeah, man. Pretty cool. And if you guys Thanks do any, having me. if you guys do anything and you're anywhere near up, well, we're going. Oh, for that's, sure. That's yeah, we'll, we'll show bottom up. line, we'll be there. Yeah. We'll, we'll do a cast from there. <laughs> yes, we will. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Brad, thank you very much again for taking your time out of your busy day, and uh, have yourself a great one, my friend. All right, you too. All right, All right man, take thanks. care. And there you have the story. Oh, that's the greatest story ever. Wow. <laughs> Hey. Yeah, that was cool. I mean, there, you know, I'm, there's got to be people. There's going to be people that know that band from the days before, and then and him making that little bit of announcement there. Yeah, just that, that little there's tease. A possibility that those four are going to get back together. All right, don't, 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 don't jinx it. I know, jinx it. but hang on, man, because That's let me tell it. you, that thing was a steamroller when it was going. And, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy that he wanted to speak about you know the early days and mm-hmm. Rathchild and souls and everything you know I, I i did want to have him on the show from a front of house perspective like i was saying sure. you know and well, get his take on on not only technology that's in front of him but the you know what's happening on stage yeah. and well we covered it yeah well, we definitely covered <laughs> it but i'm glad he was he was at home about talking about the you know the, the actual guitar and amp end of things and yeah. actually coming full circle back around to it which was awesome so a lot of years in that bus in that van so, oh yeah uh, you know he can't deny it you know <laughs> oh, no no not at all you know uh, you know some guys it's like that's not where i am now i don't want to uh, deal with that we've already yeah we've dealt with that yeah and, so th- thanks brad no oh, yeah he's a stand-up guy man yeah I have talked to that guy, and he probably doesn't remember you know at a bar talking to him asking questions and never gave me the the stink eye never tried to blow me off Mm -hmm. full conversation and just the nicest guy and that was every single one of those dudes in that band awesome they were just the most down-to-earth guys and you know you always hear that but these were just they were working musicians but they were also fans you know you'd see them at hammer jacks watching another band oh yeah for sure yeah you know absolutely and it was just it was an awesome thing and and yeah I, I tell you that that was one of those things that I often, you know, it's how the music biz is, but they just never got to that mm-hmm. thing. And Pantera went crazy, you know. Yeah, and see, and they right were, at that point, two parallels, yeah. and one goes one way, and one goes a slightly different way, and yeah, it's, you know. And I forget what Pantera was on. I think they were on like Atco or something like that when they when they hit real big. I don't remember. I can't remember. And I, you were a much larger fan than oh yeah so. and uh, but i just was like when those two played together i was like wow mm-hmm. you know because you really it had to be see, a hell of a show oh, was, especially that early on you know that was, was that's crazy you know that's that's like early raw pantera oh know, was, they yeah. were you know they were they were all fresh yeah you yeah, know yeah. phil had not gotten into the heavy drugs that he got into later in their career and it was it was you could tell they were they were a band of brothers and they were they were 
tearing it up. Mm -hmm. This was Pantera. Yeah. But the friendship, I remember at the end of the show, just real quick story, at the end of the show, um, Rathchild's playing. They were headlining because it was at Hammerjacks, right? That co-headlining thing. Mm -hmm. At the end of the show, there's Dimebag and Rex out on stage with Phil (laughs) singing, and there's Vinny up playing with Shannon. Nice. They all were on stage together doing their thing, and they were doing some song. I don't even know what it was. I can't. I can't doesn't matter. Remember, but doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, right? No. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Terry, that's the way it should be. Terry could do the best ace of spades, I think, this <laughs> side of of the Atlantic. And he even did the thing with the microphone. Where up, put, so you yeah, sing up in so the air. Yeah. Sing up. I oh, remember that. That was back in their cover days. Uh-huh. You know, but just an awesome band. And and I know I'm a metalhead guy in that sense, but that is, that was one of those things because that was Baltimore's deal. You oh, know? yeah. That was our own home thing. And, and there's not many heavy bands. Uh, Clutch, maybe, but they're from out there, aren't they? Aren't they from out in Hagerstown? I don't know where they're originally based. Um, I, 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 I thought they they're were. They're heavy, but they're a different kind of They're heavy. not, yeah, they're not in that realm of what, uh, you know, Souls or Wrathchild yeah. or even Pantera in that sense. But, you know, just another, they're, they're another good band. Though. Oh, they're a killer band. Yeah, Love yeah. Clutch. Yeah, yeah they're, they're cool. Mm-hmm. They look like they, you know, like just worked on a motor <laughs> and then just got up on stage. They come out and bludgeon you. Yeah, you and just, <laughs> just start playing, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, I love those guys. So, oh. until next time, my friend. And there will be, because they just keep getting better times. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to one and all. And I'm Mick Marcelino. And you? That just leaves me to be Jeff Bober. And we're always saying... Onward. Be sure and follow the show on Twitter, at Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments... And everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening.